This talk is about bloated MVPs, startups that raised money for logically impossible ideas. So here's the startup journey, right? You need to get one user and then you'll grow and eventually you'll have a thousand users, you'll have a million users. My question is, where do most startups usually end up? Where do they die if they're going to die? And it's a trick question because I didn't mention that before you get one user, there's still a lot of work. You start with zero users. And the great filter is actually here. The thing that kills most startups happens before they get to one user. In fact, in my experience, 80% of startups end up here, which is shocking. Um, only 20% of startups make it here in the one to infinity user range. Is getting one user really that hard? Because to me, this seems, like I said, shocking. What the hell is wrong with 80% of startups if they can't even get one user? I claim it's because most startup ideas fail a basic logical sanity check, and the founders don't realize it. The logical sanity check is, can you just give me one example of your idea? Which specific person will be your first user? Which specific moment of their life are you vastly improving? All right, now I'm going to show you three startups that fail the sanity check to some degree. The first one is called Openland. Uh, they build themselves as a modern social network enabling meaningful relationships and positive culture. So here's a screenshot. You can see it's uh, a lot like Slack. Um, they have a lot of the same features as Slack. They have uh, these threads, these channels, basically, uh, travel hacks, wine enthusiasts, these topics. And in each one, it looks like one of these Slack chat rooms. Uh, and you can see people are talking. There's attachments. There's reactions. So it's pretty slick. And you can see they have a ton of investors. This is from their AngelList page. Uh, they were incubated by Y Combinator. Uh, so a lot of people believe in this idea, um, but I claim that it fails my initial sanity check uh, of which specific person is your first user and which specific moment in their life are you vastly improving, right? So their site actually has a list of their top communities. So it seems like it should be easy to answer, hey, who's this for? Well, look at the number one thing, it's for founders. Look at all these other founders who are here. So, but I checked out the founders community and here's a snapshot of 24 hours of activity and it, it's not really happening in here, right? It's like a couple people saying a couple things, a couple reactions. So it doesn't seem like much of a community and this is their number one community. And I checked a few others and it's all the same stuff. So I don't really know what's going on uh, in terms of like, it doesn't seem like they have a good active community. Now here's my conversation from uh, July, 2019. I chatted with the founder of Openland and I asked him the same questions that I'm asking now uh, about, you know, who's the first user, what are they using it for? Um, and he said that their approach is to be horizontal in functionality and vertical in user base, i.e. building super generic features while attracting high-end focused audiences first. And I said, sounds interesting at a high level, but what could that really mean lower level? I find that I often mentally try the exercise of replacing a high level pitch with a very specific story. And he said, we will go hundreds of value props. It'll be a lot of step ups. Any social network is hundreds of value props. Basically, we want to become number one work chat. Uh, and then I said, do you have a particular prediction for what value prop might click first? And he said, no idea. We operate week to week. I mean, I have a list of 100 value props, but reality defies predictions. Our investor calls this serendipity hunting. All right, so there's serendipity hunting among hundreds of ideas. And yet, as far as I can tell, I don't think that they found one. So to me, something seems fundamentally wrong. Like I said, I don't think that they're passing the sanity check of knowing who the first person who is going to get value, who that person is. All right, let's move on to startup number two. This one's called Axiom, and it builds itself as a cryptocurrency that lets you build, distribute, and run JavaScript-based applications uncensored by any central authority. Um, so the founder is very legit. Um, he was uh, uh, he previously built a very popular startup called Parse. Uh, they sold to Facebook for $85 million. Um, he knows what he's doing. Paul Graham endorses his programming skills. Um, so there's a lot of uh, IQ points and talent going into this project. Um, and so I have to apply the sanity check. Which specific person is your first user? Which specific moment in their life are you vastly improving? So here's a conversation I had on Twitter last year. I said, what might the first popular app be running on this platform? Uh, and he says, my guess is some form of social app, financial type applications work okay on existing blockchains, social applications require more data. A country where Twitter is blocked entirely or sometimes gets blocked entirely is one example I think about. 
Okay, so he's thinking about an example where somebody builds basically a Twitter that's um, more robust against censorship. Okay, great. So where is the robust Twitter? Like, what's going on? Well, uh, here they've done eight months of work. Uh, it looks like checking the GitHub. So from May to December 2009, there's a lot of programming work, but I don't see any applications launched. So why build all this stuff without making sure that the robust Twitter or something launches? And I do think that this is committing the same error of not being really specific about who this is for. All right. Uh, the next startup is Arbital. Uh, so Arbital builds itself as a hybrid blogging and wiki platform. And so, all right, seems pretty generic. So which specific person is your first user? Which specific moment in their life are you vastly improving? Uh, well, they they have a really good specific article that I think is a good answer to this question. Uh, so they have a, a Bayes rule guide. And the article, they have a fancy feature where you get to, as a reader, you get to say which case fits you best. I want to have a basic theoretical and practical understanding, or I can easily read algebra. So they have different versions of the guide. They have different uh, modules within it that they can mix and match. So there's some sophisticated functionality here, making this like a quality experience. Um, okay, so as a reader, um, I've read this myself. I think it's great. I really appreciate this piece of content. And so um, there's definitely some sparks of goodness here. And I would even argue that Arbital passed the great filter because I read their articles and I'm like, hey, this is pretty good. They hosted good content. And so I would put them somewhere out here. They have more than one user, maybe less than a thousand users, but they have more than one. Okay, great. And I think that they got here by writing high quality content, which attracted readers. All right. So it's this place that hosts high quality content. Um, now, of course, the investment was pretty large to get here, right? It looks like it took three person years of coding, 2016 to 2017, with two people. It looks like hundreds of articles uh, were written, right? So in order to get these hundred or maybe a thousand uh, readers, they also have to write hundreds of articles. All right, so they got here by writing this content. Uh, and I think that naturally, if they were to write more high quality content, they can get here. Um, the only problem is that's labor intensive, right? And so. I never understood which specific person was supposed to keep writing more content if they wanted to get more users. Um, I, I just didn't get it. Um, and I'm not sure that they ever had a specific plan. I think that they just thought that the platform was really cool and they should keep building it and maybe more high quality content will come, but they didn't say how. That's what I think. All right, so here's my general advice for how to overcome the great filter. It's very simple. You just have to make sure that you know how you're gonna improve one specific person's life. It sounds really simple, but if you do it, you'll instantly be in the top 20% of startups. That's it, and you can check out my blog for more. It's called bloatedmvp.com. Thanks.